um, with that, uh, I will. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Pete first. He will uh, discuss the uh, current uh, convertible bond market um, uh, together with uh, Claude. And after that, I'll, I'll uh, uh, kind of discuss some of the uh, tax um, issues that come up with convertible bonds and um, then hand it over to Anna to uh, talk about a few um, other considerations for issuers of bonds, uh, convertible bonds. So, with that, uh, Pete, uh, over to you. Thanks, Ramel, and uh, thank you, Anna, as well, for inviting us here again this year to talk about converts. We're very happy to do so. Um, we prepared a few slides on the product in general and uh, also on, on some trends in the market. We're starting here on slide four. Um, the takeaway here is you know, last year, especially coming out of the pandemic, issuance hit record numbers, um, levels that we haven't seen. These, these statistics on this slide relate specifically to convertible bonds, which is where we're going to spend most of uh, our time during the discussion today. Um, so, you know, almost, almost 90 billion raised last year, 10 plus year high, uh, on pace to surpass that this year. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the pace of issuance as well. Um, uh, last year, coming out of the pandemic, it was really just a, uh, a torrid pace of issuance. It was one of the first asset classes that came back after the three or four week hiatus uh, beginning in, in, in March of 2020. And it really never looked back as far as the convert product goes. And that continued very strongly into most of Q1 of this year. Um, but the, the supply in Q1 alone was uh, more than full years for, I believe, three of the last five years. And so with that came a little bit of uh, digestion issues in terms of the buy side being able to just evaluate and, and purchase this, this amount of product. And, and so we did see a slowdown in the end of, uh, of Q1, and that was into Q2. But I, I would tell you, and I think Claude would agree, that over the last uh, three or four weeks, the market seems to be back into a, into a healthy place. Uh, and issuers are once again getting uh, some great terms that you can see on this slide as well. Um, in 2020, average coupons were down versus 2019. Average premiums were uh, well above average. And into 2021, um, con con continued improvement. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, um, I'll, I'll tell you that most converts are in that upper category that we call plain vanilla. It's almost a cookie cutter approach when it comes to structuring. Uh, however, there's almost an infinite number of ways that an issuer can structure the bond to overcome specific hurdles, whether that hurdle is technical in nature, meaning maybe the stock isn't liquid enough, uh, or there's an issue with the availability for investors to borrow this stock in the stock loan market, or if it's specific to the issuer in terms of credit quality, there's different ways and levers that you can pull within this product uh, to, to structure the bond such that it will clear the market. Um, at the bottom of the page is, is the most equity-like end of the spectrum. Uh, this is a mandatory convertible preferred. It's really an equity substitute. There are a few variants that have some debt-like features, but ultimately uh, this mandatory product is one that converts automatically into shares after, after three years. Next slide, please. We're just taking a step back here and breaking the convert down into its component parts. Simply, it's, it's an unsecured bond. Uh, it's typically five to seven year maturity, and it's coupled with a call option that is exercised as a holder's option into a fixed number of shares. There's some standard ratio adjustments that could change the number of shares, but generally that's the case. Um, the option value acts to reduce the interest expense as compared to a non-convertible option for the same issuer. Uh, so that's why you'll see coupons very low in, in, in this asset class. And then we'll touch on this later, but the accounting treatment of the security varies depending on how the issuer structures the option in terms of how they, how they want to settle it if there is a conversion event. Flip to the next page, please. Uh, why do issuers choose the convert product uh, versus alternatives. 
Uh, we won't go through all these bullet points, but key advantages from the issuer's perspective is the unsecured nature of the security. There's no collateral. There's no financial or maintenance covenants. Um, the cash coupon is very low. Uh, it does not require a credit rating, so you don't have to go through a ratings process as you would for a, for a high yield offering. Um, it can be structured with minimal dilution because you can settle this security partially in cash or fully in cash, uh, depending on, 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 on your objectives. And it can be executed quickly. Uh, typically, the execution from awarding the mandate to the underwriter or the underwriter team to, to pricing the deal is two to three weeks. And most transactions are executed via Rule 144A rather than as, as registered securities. Next page, please. So we, we just wanted to cite some common reasons here why issuers choose this product. And candidly, the most commonly cited use of proceeds uh, is, is general corporate purposes. It's one of the few asset classes out there, um, especially if the issuer has a demonstrated history of successfully acquiring and integrating acquisitions. Um, you know, convert investors on the buy side are very happy to basically uh, pre-fund the next round of, of, of expected acquisitions and, and do a transaction for general corporate purposes. Some of the other common reasons that we list here, uh, the, the next most common be refinancing debt, whether it's, um, you know, a floating rate loan that's secured from, from, a, from the traditional bank market uh, or, or high yield debt that's coming due. Uh, funding an announced acquisition is a common use of proceeds within the mandatory convertible preferred product. Um, and, 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 and oftentimes we see this product being used as a supplement um, if the issuer is, has a large capital need that cannot be satisfied via uh, one or several other capital markets alternatives, then the convert gets added to the process as well, because there is a distinct uh, subset of buyers that are convert dedicated. So it, it does open up uh, additional uh, paths to capital. Next page, please. In terms of factors that impact pricing and feasibility, um, some of these are very self-explanatory. I would uh, highlight specifically coming out of COVID, offering size, so convertible offering size, you, you, you all may have heard in the high yield market, you know, it's gotta be a $300 million deal or, or larger to attract uh, the, the, the right in, uh, investors and increase the efficiency of the transaction. Convert, uh, for many years, you know, there was, there was highly efficient market in the, you know, $75 million and up range. Coming out of COVID, the average offering size is actually north of 500 million now. And because of that, liquidity and offering size has taken on increased uh, importance uh, from, from, from the buy side. That's not to say that smaller transactions in the $100 million range are not possible. It's just that there is a premium paid from investors for that larger transaction that's gonna be liquid and it's gonna give them um, an opportunity to, to, to trade the security in the secondary market. Um, Obviously, creditworthiness. At the end of the day, this is a fixed income security. So, after the five or seven years, the issuer would have to repay this in cash if there isn't a conversion event. So, creditworthiness is key. Um, the issuer's liquidity uh, within the common stock is an important factor as well. Okay, so Ramelt is going to cover the tax aspect of this topic, um, but this has definitely become more prevalent over the last several years. Historically, uh, this capped call or call spread product, which is a separate derivative that the issuer purchases when they do the convertible bond. Uh, and, and the reason they purchase it is to get a jumbo conversion premium that would not be available from, from the convertible buy side. So historically about 30% of issuers use this strategy. Last year it was 70%, uh, and this year we're right at 60%. So it's definitely become more, more popular over the last several years. Um, one change over the, uh, over the last year or so is how this derivative is being purchased. So historically, the issuer would go to the left lead manager or the, or, or the joint book runners, and they would simply price this, this derivative and sell it to the issuer. Whereas now, um, there, there are a lot more convertible advisors out there that are, you know, helping the issuer get through the capital markets process. 
in those instances, it's, it's always an auction process. But even when those advisors are not involved, we're more frequently seeing that this derivative is being auctioned off to call it a half dozen different uh, derivatives desks so that the issuer has more uh, transparency in, into the pricing and, and generally the process uh, becomes more efficient because of that. Next page, please. So on this page, um, we, we, we're just looking at the market in 2021, trying to draw out in, in terms of the liquidity comment I made earlier, how important that is in terms of pricing. So if you look at the top portion of that page where we're breaking it down by market cap buckets, it's, it's, it's almost linear moving from the top to the bottom. You'll see that the larger the issuer gets, the lower the coupon and the higher the conversion premium. And likewise, uh, in, the, in, in the next section, the offering size bucket, the larger the offering is, therefore, the more liquid it is, again, a linear progression to uh, more, more efficient pricing in terms of coupon and premium. To the extent that even uh, within the greater than 1 billion mark, uh, offering size range, it has been 13 transactions in that bucket this year, the average coupon is, is just above 0%. Uh, so that gives you a sense for how, how much demand there is for this product in the market today. So here we just break down issuance by sector. Um, historically, for the last three or so years, tech has been the leading sector in terms of issuance. This year, it's uh, playing second fiddle to consumer discretionary. A lot of the consumer discretionary companies broadly defined, you know, we're talking about cruise lines, airlines, restaurants, et cetera, use this product at the onset of the pandemic. And now we're starting to see some of these uh, issuers uh, use the product opportunistically because the terms are, are, are so attractive coming out of the pandemic. Um, healthcare is always in the top two or three, and then you can see uh, it, it kind of trails off after that. So we get this question a lot from, um, from, from managers that have not issued before, and, 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 their, and, and their question typically is, well, if we're coming up to a maturity or a couple years out and we're not confident that we're going to be able to refinance this instrument, what are some strategies that, that we can use to either push this out or, uh, or, or swap it into, in, in, into shares, et cetera? And, and the answer is, you know, there's, there's a number of ways that you can do that. The least common would be a registered exchange uh, or, or a registered tender offer uh, because this product is subject to tender offer rules. Um, that, that common stock is, is subject to because there is that equity link piece of it. And so more frequently, we see privately negotiated exchanges, whether that's via Rule 4A2 or Rule 3A9. And by far the most common, especially over the last two years, is what we call an amend and extend. And this is a transaction that the issuer simultaneously issues a new security into the market via a regular uh, process and simultaneously repurchase, repurchases a large portion of an existing convert. In some cases, we've seen that as, as large as 80%. Um, it depends on the, the nature of the, uh, of, of, of the security that's being repurchased, whether it's very closely held or whether there's a, a, a large number of holders. But generally, we hear about 80% can be repurchased without subjecting yourself to a, to, to, to a tender offer. Uh, I think I, uh, I think the Pete the the one um, the one um, aspect that uh, we should add here is that the way these converts have been structured, uh, you know, given the settlement mechanism where the issuer has the option of settling in cash and common shares, um, the structure is typically involves some contingent conversion features that um, limit when investors can convert. This is fairly standard now in the market. Um, you know, in the, in, in the good old days, um, convert was con convertible into common equity at any point in time. But now since the security has morphed into, um, into a, a structure where the issuer has the ability to control what consideration investors get upon conversion, um, the, the security limits when um, investors can convert, and those are typically contingent conversion clauses, such as 
um, you know, there's a there's a time period during which if the stock is north of 130% north of the conversion price, then investors have a window during which they can convert. There's a trading price condition that allows uh, investors to convert, which is basically if the bond is trading below intrinsic value. So those are some of the features that go into these in, into the structures that get negotiated out um, at at maturity, um, and then that should be distinct from uh, the other contingent conversion securities that were issued, which were contingent interest securities, can co-pay securities, and we haven't seen many of those, uh, just given the fact that they weren't very popular with uh, with long only investors, uh, given the tax implications. So I just wanted to make sure that that uh, that gets uh, uh, noted here when discussing uh, how these converts get refinanced out, what are the structures that are typically in the market during these uh, these refinancing events. Pete? Claude, um, good, good point that I missed there. Um, let's, let's flip to the next page. The next two are important because this is going into effect uh, shortly. Um, recently, there was a vote to simplify the accounting for converts. For the last 12 years or so, um, there's been two different models. Um, the, 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 the old model, which, which we often call plain vanilla, which Claude just described as convertible only into shares, convertible at any time by the holder. That security was simply uh, appearing on the balance sheet as debt, uh, no, no separation of debt and equity, uh, very simple on, uh, from an EPS standpoint, it was accounted for on an, on, on an if converted basis, assuming it was non-dilutive. Um, so, so kind of, you know, very simple to, to account for that security. But all of the other securities where the issuer had an option to settle conversions in cash were subject to bifurcation where at issuance, the issuer would determine the value of the liability and the value of the equity and separate that on the balance sheet. And what that created was a non-cash interest expense um, that accreted the, the, the discount debt liability to par over the life of the security. And so it created a lot of noise on the balance sheet, but in exchange for that, the issuer did not have to use the if converted method of accounting. They had to use, they were allowed to use the treasury stock method. So it was less dilutive um, to the share count. Um, well, after 12 years of that, they're, they're simplifying and they're doing away with the bifurcation method, um, except for securities that, that uh, are subject to embedded derivative accounting, which in, which in the 100 transactions uh, that we talked about on the previous page, I, I don't think there are any that qualify for that accounting, uh, if there are very few. And so what's happening now is um, the issuer is Again, just simply showing the debt on the balance sheet at face value minus fees and expenses that are being amortized, just like any other debt security. And from an, from an EPS standpoint, they're all subject to the if converted method. Um, there is, the, 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 there's one exception to that, and um, I did clarify this directly with, with, with the FASB, is that if the issuer elects net share settlement, which means if someone converts, you'll receive $1,000 par value back in cash and the in the money portion in shares. If the issuer irrevocably elects that method of settlement, uh, they will be allowed to use the treasury stock method of accounting. And so you're kind of getting, you're, you're losing a little bit of flexibility because the most popular instrument, um, if we flip to the next page, is called instrument X. And this instrument gives the issuer full flexibility upon conversion to, to offer shares, cash, or any combination um, in, in the event of a conversion. So, so if you're gonna go to the net share settlement feature, you, you're, you're losing that ultimate flexibility, but in exchange, you're getting a better accounting treatment from a diluted EPS standpoint. Um, there's some other conditions here that we try to draw out the key differences and, and uh, we'll leave that for your reference when the, when the uh, presentation gets um, put, on, put, put on the website. Okay, so let's uh, look at the tax considerations in respect of uh, convertible debt. 
Um, and I'll, I'll start with, I mean, just, just maybe the first obvious observation is that convertible debt is debt for tax purposes, right? So the, the starting point to analyze an, a financial instrument for taxes, try to cubbyhole it into a particular um, uh, cubbyhole, um, you know, options are, are debt, equity, um, or some kind of derivative, right, whether it's an option or, or a swap or something like that, forward, et cetera. Different tax rules for different instruments. In this case, convertible debt is principal protected, and we would treat it as, as indebtedness for tax. Uh, so interest, the interest paid by the issuer um, is deductible, uh, and the interest received by the holder is essentially uh, ordinary interest income. Uh, conversion of of the instrument, so so the conversion into um, uh, equity is a non-taxable event, um, and, and and I've cited the uh, kind of the revenue ruling that supports that on the slide. Um, now, when you have a debt instrument, there are then different tax rules that address the tax treatment of an instrument. Um, Examples are, you know, fixed rate debt, uh, variable rate debt, or uh, essentially contingent payment debt. So depending on what category a debt instrument falls into, there are different rules that would apply to that category. The um, uh, instruments that are contingent payment debt instruments, essentially, as, as the name reveals, are instruments that have some contingency attached to them. Um, the, the right to convert into the stock of the issuer is not a contingency for these purposes. So the mere fact that the instrument is, is convertible does not make it a what we call a CPDI, Contingent Payment Debt Instrument. There is a, you know, I, I won't go into uh, the, you know, the details on this presentation, but there's a whole set of separate tax rules that deal with um, uh, you know, the tax treatment of contingent payment debt instruments. Essentially what it means is finding the comparable yield of a non-contingent instrument. And so uh, I think it was one of the, <clears throat> one of the slides that uh, Pete went over, if, if, I'm, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly, you know, you were saying, well, you know, the normal coupon is like 7.5%, but then it's 5% lower because of the convert, so the, the cash coupon is 2.5. So, you know, the comparable yield would be like 7.5%. And so what people have done in the past, and, and I think Claude mentioned this, um, I forget what you call it, Claude, I think you call it like the contingent pay converts or something like that. Uh, so which is the, the the you know the different type than the ones we're seeing now in the market that used to be a little bit more popular, but so the you know the tax trick there was creating a contingency separate from the conversion. So you'd have a contingent coupon payment or something like that, but you you would create an additional contingency. At that point, the issuer finds the comparable yield. Let's say that was 7.5 percent, and so the benefit of that structure. Uh, which is called, you know, the contingent convertibles, is that an issuer gets to deduct 7.5% 7. 7 in interest on an annual basis, yet is only paying 2.5. So it's a it's a benefit, <clears throat> arguably or potentially temporary, potentially in part permanent benefit for the issuer between tax deductions and cash outlay, and then you know the corollary is that an investor. Um, assuming it's a taxable U.S. investor would be picking up that 7.5% while only receiving 2.5% in cash, which well, but would, would get settled in the back end. So cash and tax will follow, but there's a um, timing uh, a difference there. Uh, so <clears throat> that's kind of a. I just wanted to highlight that. That's a. It's a. It's a conversion convertible debt with you know extra tax benefits. But um, as Claude was saying. Uh, has become a more rare uh, animal these days. Um, then on the next bullet, the, the holder does not allocate any of its purchase price to the conversion feature. So you know, you're not you're not like bifurcating 
the uh, the price paid for the instruments, but we're just allocating the whole thing to the indebtedness itself. The issuer doesn't have gain or loss when stock is issued upon conversion, so it's it's tax free for a holder upon conversion. It is um, also tax free to the issuer. And then um, the final bullet: an issuer cannot deduct repurchase premium to the extent it exceeds the adjusted issue price of the debt instrument plus a normal call premium. That's uh, specifically provided for in the uh, Internal Revenue Code. All right, next slide. Um, so, you know, we, we, we typically try to minimize references to, uh, you know, tax code sections, but um, kind of in this area, um, you know, convertible bond area, these, these kind of issues get referred to through the, um, you know, references to the code section. So I just put them out here in case that comes up and it's helpful to know. So section 163L, um, and I'll work through on this slide kind of the, um, the terms that are being used in the, um, in the statute since it's um, kind of helpful to see how that's set up and what it's deriving at. Um, but so what section 163L says that there's no deduction for interest that's paid on a disqualified debt instrument. Uh, so that would be bad. Um, and so the question then is, well, what's a disqualified debt instrument? And so that's an instrument that is payable in equity of the issuer, a related party, or equity held by the issuer. Um, so, so that last piece is not really what we're talking about with with you know flame vanilla convertible bonds, but you know there have been there have been um, uh, transactions in the marketplace where you know, a corporation might issue a debt instrument that is that is convertible into or exchangeable into a stock of, um, you know, either a subsidiary or, you know, just an interest that the issuer holds a large chunk in, in another company. Um, <clears throat> so what does uh, payable in equity mean? Um, and in this case, uh, the code defines it as you know, a substantial amount of principal or interest is required to be paid or converted, or at the issuer's option is payable or convertible in the equity, uh, or it's to be paid, to be determined, or at the issuer's option is determined by reference to the value in such equity. Uh, now, I think in 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 uh, the mo most of the plain vanilla convertible uh, offerings, you know, it's, there's no issuer option. It's really a a holder option um, where this is um, uh, relevant, and so what the I just pulled up the um, the code. So, what does it mean for a holder option? Well, the code says that principal or interest is treated as required to be paid, converted, or determined, uh, as I was just talking about, if it may be required at the option of the holder. So that could be bad. Uh, but it says there has to be a substantial certainty that the option will be exercised. And so the question is, well, what does substantial certainty mean? And uh, I think what you saw in one of the prior slides that uh, Pete had put up, it talked about the, uh, or showed the uh, conversion premium uh, for various uh, structures. And so as long as the, um, uh, conversion conversion premium is large enough. Um, uh, you know, it, it it is. There's no substantial certainty that uh, the the conversion will occur, and therefore there's no substantial certainty the holder will exercise its option. And so, uh, uh, what I would call a well structured uh, convertible bond, which is what pretty much all of them are in the market these days. Uh, Section 163L, you know, should not kick in and, and disqualify the interest deduction, uh, but it is something to be, you know, mindful of uh, and not, um, you know, not let fall through the cracks. Uh, all right, let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, convertible bond call spreads. Um, uh, you saw that on the earlier uh, slide. I think Pete went through the 
uh, you know, the, the structure that had both the option and the warrant, as well as the uh, single derivative with the capped uh, call option. So let's take a look at each structure, and I'll kind of walk through um, what the uh, what the tax benefits are there. So um, the point of it on the tax side is to uh, make an integration election. So there's a there's a specific regulation 1275-6, which addresses hedging transactions uh, for tax purposes, and so. Um, uh, what you have here are three instruments, right? So you have an issuer that has issued the convertible bond, has purchased a call option to essentially hedge its um, obligation under that bond to is issue stock, and it has issued a warrant, a, a higher strike warrant, under which it um, uh, you know, might be obligated to issue additional stock. And so the... the um, uh, the option and the warrant have slightly different terms and slightly different a, uh, uh, you know, uh, terms, essentially, maturity terms. And so the intention is for the issuer to integrate for tax purposes the convertible bond plus the call option, but to leave the warrant to the side. And so 1275-6 says, okay, identify your transaction. So what you would do is, and there's no pre-described form uh, or, or, you know, the regulation kind of sets forth the information it should contain. And so the issuer would put in its files, again, it does not have to go to the IRS. Uh, you, you, the issuer put this in its files. It's essentially an identification that it identifies the debt instrument. It, it describes the debt instrument. It identifies the hedge, which is here, the call option. Um, and it summarizes the cash flows. And so uh, I've kind of, I mean, this is highly simplified on our slide, but I'm, I'm going through um, an example here. So let's say, and I guess my example is a little bit old now that Pete has told us that issuances are more like in the $500 million range. But let's, uh, let's pretend we're at a you know, $125 million uh, offering. Uh, the cost of the call option is $25 million. So what that means is that the issue price for tax purposes would be $100 million. And the reason for that is because the, the sum of the cash flows here is issuer receives 125, it lays out 25 to buy the option. And so the net cash to the issuer is 100 million. Um, but the face amount of the convertible bond is 125. And so for tax purposes, this is treated as having been issued at a discount the discount being $25 million. So that's the OID on the instrument. Um, now, uh, so what does that mean? It means that the issuer can deduct OID over time. So um, ignoring compounding for a second, if this was a, if this was a five-year instrument, every year the issuer could deduct $5 million um, uh, you know, under the instrument as OID for a total of $25 million. So um, the the uh, now keep in mind the holder you know has purchased a convertible bond with a face of 125 million or you know, whatever the face of a, of a per bond is the holder doesn't have OID this is an issuer only um, tax fiction so this is, does not impact the holder the holder has purchased something at par. Um, equal to the face amount is not going to have OID pickup. Uh, now the warrant. Uh, so let's say issuer has sold the warrant for a hundred, or sorry, for ten million. Um, and so the the ten million um, is, is is the premium that the issuer receives. This uh, warrant does not get integrated with the bond and the call option. It is separate and stays separate. We don't put it on the hedge identification. Um, so that what happens to that 10 million is that uh, under code section 1032, um, the tax law provides that that 10 million received is not taxable income. So essentially transactions in the issuer's stock and derivatives on those stock are not deductible or taxable income. 
And so the benefit, the tax benefit here is that the issuer is able to deduct the full cost of the call option. So over time, it's able to deduct the full 25 million, even though the 10 million for the warrant is tax free. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a benefit. Um, you just gotta make sure that, you know, the warrant doesn't somehow get, get you know, sucked into the, the integration analysis. The, and, and, and that, you know, the, the, that's the reason for making sure the terms are slightly different. Um, uh, the argument being, you know, they are, they, they should not be lumped together. The IRS has uh, put out an advice memo, you see at the bottom of the, of the slide, AM 2007-014. In that advice memo, uh, they describe a transaction like this, uh, a convertible bond call spread, they analyze it uh, and, and come to the conclusion uh, that I just described. So they come to the conclusion that, you know, under the, under the circumstances they described there, the issuer does not have to integrate the warrant as well. And so you can have the separation, deduct the, the call uh, amount and, and, have, and, and receive the warrant uh, premium on a tax-free basis. Um, now let's contrast that with, um, on the next slide, uh, uh, a situation where we have a capped call. Um, so there, essentially, you know, if, if I'm understanding the economics correctly, the, the call and the warrant are essentially smushed together. Um, and so, you know, again, we're issuing a bond for uh, $125 million. The cost of the cap uh, call option is 15. And so if we integrate those two things, the tax issue price is 110. Uh, so that results in 15 million of OID. And again, this does not affect the holder. This only affects the issuer. Um, and so the issuer now has deemed OID. It's 15 million. It's that 15 that gets gets deductible or deducted over time. So if, if the example is a fi five-year instrument, it would be, um, uh, I guess, three million per year. Not, not, you know, I'm ignoring compounding, which the OID rules don't ignore compounding, by the way, but I'm just making the math simple for myself. Uh, so it's a, there's a difference here in, um, in the tax treatments. I think we heard from Pete earlier there are non-tax uh, differences in the treatments between the two. Um, uh, and so you've got to weigh the pros and cons between the two. Um, against kind of the tax benefits of, uh, of, the, of the first version versus the, the second version. Um, with that, um, I, will, I will turn it to um, Anna to um, uh, go over other uh, considerations for uh, issuers. Thanks, Ramal. Okay. So um, most converts are issued pursuant to Rule 144A. And uh, they're issued in what we generally refer to as a traditional 144A offering, meaning that um, the uh, investment banks are acting, like Raymond James would be acting as um, initial purchasers. So uh, the investment banks or initial purchasers would be buying from the issuer on a firm commitment basis. They would be acting as principal, taking principal risk, buying the um, convert on a, that, that the issuer is offering to the initial purchasers on a 4A2 or private placement basis, and then reselling the convert to qualified institutional buyers, to quibs, uh, pursuant to Rule 144A, and oftentimes as well offering the convert to non-U.S. Uh, persons pursuant to Regulation F. So that's the, the majority of the 144A uh, convert market. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you'll often also see some situations where you'll have a, an issuer that's choosing to do a convert, but perhaps um, there'll be special circumstances. For example, they're choosing to do a convert maybe to raise um, 
the necessary funds to finance an acquisition. And it may not be possible in connection with the acquisition to have um, prepared in time the requisite pro forma financials that are um, compliant with SX or perhaps the target um, audited historical financials. Maybe it's a situation where um, Target is a subsidiary or it's a carve-out type of situation. And so that may be an instance where an investment bank might be uncomfortable with acting as initial purchaser and taking principal risk and being directly in the distribution chain only because if it were, um, it wouldn't be able to receive a standard comfort letter from the auditors where you have a situation like the one I described with um, pro formas maybe that aren't SX compliant or um, target financials that um, don't comply with GAAP or maybe um, have not been, have not gone through a full audit and so on. So you may have all of the necessary information, but maybe not in the form that you would want it in if you were doing a traditional 144A. So there's a solution for that. And in those instances, what we've done is to a 144A qualifying uh, offering. And what that allows you to do is to market the transaction as you would a traditional 144A in the sense that the investment banks will be named as placement agents, they'll be on the cover, they'll be clearly identified as agents. So they won't be taking the securities from the issuer. Rather, the issuer will be selling the securities directly to investors, all of whom will be quit. And <clears throat> the transaction will issue um, and settle directly through DTC. So from the perspective of the investors, the investors are really going to be quite agnostic um, because they're still going to be receiving securities that bear 144A QCIP and um, that clear and settle through DTC. So from the investor's perspective, there's not, not much of a difference. The only document uh, that may be a little different in the context of this 144A qualifying transaction is that because the investors are indeed taking the securities from the issuer, there will be a subscription agreement between the issuer and each of the purchasers where the issuers do get the benefit of reps and warranties that are made to them by the issuer directly. Of course, last but not least, you could do a convert as on a registered basis, on a full SEC registered basis. Next slide. There are good reasons why um, we all prefer to do a, a convert on a 144A basis. The principal one being that all of the different strategies that he um, Claude and Remmel talked about these various um, anti-dilutive strategies, whether it's a call spread, the capped call, any of these are much easier to implement um, as well as an outright um, open market repurchase. All of these are easier to implement if you're doing a Rule 144A transaction since with Rule 144A, there's an exemption from Regulation M. So Regulation M is, of course, um, an anti-manipulation rule, and Reg M um, prohibits certain activities to be undertaken by the issuer, by affiliates of the issuer, and by distribution participants in and around the time of a distribution. So if an issuer were um, undertaking a registered offering of a convertible security, it would be very difficult, not impossible, just simply very difficult to do some of these anti-dilutive transactions in conjunction with um, the issuance of the convert itself. So much easier to do in connection with a 144A. 
Um, the other point to be made is, of course, the, in order for the convert to um, be able to be um, sold in reliance on the 144A exemption, the convert has to have an effective conversion premium um, so that we avoid the fungibility issues. That's relatively easy to calculate, and the conversion premium just has to be measured on the date of issuance. So um, if the stock has moved, you only have to worry about um, the issuance date. Reg rights. Um, I would say that investors have become less focused on reg rights than they might have been in the past, and we can probably attribute this to the fact that um, over time, the holding period under Rule 144 has been reduced. So now um, it's the case that with many um, public companies that issue converts under 144A, um, you simply just have an undertaking, a covenant in the indenture that when you get past the six month mark, um, the company will instruct the indenture trustee to move the entire position um, from the restricted 144A QCIP to a non-restricted QCIP since um, the securities have been held for um, the, the six month holding period provided that um, affiliates have not been holding the securities and you can comply with the 144 holding period. Um, of course, if you have affiliates um, or you have other special circumstances, then perhaps um, you have uh, reg rights or you might have um, an AB exchange, but I would say that um, we see that less and less these days. So we'll go on to the next slide on um, conversion price adjustments. So um, there are a number of different types of conversion rate adjustments that are um, that are built into a uh, convert um, that are meant to sort of give the convertible note holder kind of the benefit of, of the bargain. Um, the anti-dilution adjustments, um, so adjustments for stock dividends, for stock splits, stock combinations, um, these are really the simplest. You're just adjusting the conversion rate um, proportionately, um, so with the resulting change in, in the number of outstanding shares. So you're just sort of playing with um, on the adjustment factor um, and the adjustment factor, that, that's the, the fraction that you see um, in the description of notes all of the time. Um, that has a denominator, the denominator equals the number of shares that were outstanding before the event, the event being the dividend, the stock split, the stock combination. <coughs> um, so um, those, are, those are relatively easy. Um, of course, if um, you have a, an issuer that you know going in, is like a regular dividend um, paying company, then um, of course, in, in terms of sort of pricing the convert or setting the economic terms of the note, um, the dividend is kind of gonna be baked into um, the terms of the note um, because you're going to assume that um, the issuer is gonna continue for the term of the note to pay the regular dividends throughout. So it's really supposed to take into account um, special dividends, if you will, or um, situations where you have um, a company that maybe isn't a regular dividend payer. Um, you can have other special events that, like the ones that we identify. Um, so a spinoff, right, where an issuer, for example, um, distributes the shares of, of capital stock or the equity securities of an affiliate or a subsidiary. Um, you can have a, an in-kind distribution um, where an issuer is distributing um, property 
of uh, a subsidiary. So these are things that are a little bit um, less common, um, but we still provide for them in um, all of the all of the conversion adjustments that we build in. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Change of control. Um, so change of control, you'll usually see this referred to um, as a fundamental change provision or a make whole fundamental change provision. So um, this will um, generally, again, kind of serve to compensate um, the holder of the note in the event that during the term of the note, certain events occur. So um, it used to be that these were fairly narrowly written so that they covered certain um, mergers only. Now they cover other provisions, so usually a merger, but also a situation where um, the company's stock gets delisted. So it's intended to cover a, a lack of liquidity, um, if you will. Um, and in this case, um, there's usually uh, an opportunity um, for uh, a um, <coughs> for an increased conversion rate, or sometimes um, for additional shares being added to the conversion rate. Um, maybe I'll pause here. I don't know, Pete, Claude, if you want to say the the fundamental change provision, the make whole. This is often important to holders. I don't know if there's anything that you want to add in this respect. Um, Anna, I, I, I agree. Very important um, to to not just the buyers of the convert, but also especially if you're a first-time issuer, it's one of the more um, challenging things to, to explain. And really, the way we try to explain it is if you, if you put yourself in the shoes of the convertible investor uh, and, the, and the company that you own this convert in, is taken over for, for, for cash. That's typically the most commonly, uh, that's the most common time that this fundamental change provision comes into play. Uh, so you have this convert, there's an option and there's option value. So this convert will trade at some premium to the intrinsic value of the shares that you can convert into because there's still time value left in, in, in that option. But if there's a cash takeover, that option value collapses right to intrinsic value. And so this make hold feature in terms of a fundamental change, which also happens to be the exact same make hold feature that is often used uh, in the event that the issuer calls the bond away after year three, so an issuer redemption option. Uh, this, this make hold is, in, is, is structured so that the holder gets that option value back. And the way it's structured, there's a, there's a standard model, and the model basically runs a Black-Scholes valuation at different points in time and at different stock prices to value that option. And again, that, that is intended just to make the investor whole for the option value that they're losing when, when the company either calls the bond or there's a, there's a cash takeover. There's other definitions for the fundamental change, but again, the most common one is a, is a cash takeover. And the important thing for the issuer to know is that in no event will you ever be worse off than had you issued common stock at the stock price when, when the convert was priced. So the most onerous this make hole is, is if the issuer does the convert and the next day they get acquired for cash at the conversion price. Um, it will make this security look like the issuer had simply issued common stock instead of had they had they issued the convert. So that's sorry to get into the weeds there, but that's um, that's an important point that that Anna brought up here. Pete, let's stay with me for a second because the next slide is redemption, and um, mm -hmm. like you said, the the two things are tied together, right, or very closely related. Um, so, convert holders are also, um, as Pete said, really sensitive to redemption rights, or maybe um, the better way to say it is maybe more sensitive to redemption than um, 
a holder of, of maybe a typical um, straight note. Um, and so we also tend to spend a fair bit of time focusing on um, the redemption provisions and when a holder, when, when a, an issuer can redeem the notes. Um, and I, you know, they're, they're, at least the bankers tell us or tell our issuer clients that there's um, a close interplay in terms of the pricing of the convert and how much flexibility the issuer is going to have in terms of when or how it can redeem. Um, and obviously, there's also um, a, usually, a uh, redemption make whole. So maybe, Pete or Claude, maybe you want to just say a few words on that, that interaction. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll try to go from, from the beginning. Typically these are, let's say a five year security is by far the most common tenor for a convert. And the most common redemption feature is a three year non-call with the option to call it after three years if the stock is trading at a 30% premium to the conversion price. Um, so, so in that instance, if you think about it, the, the conversion option is deep in the money. So if the issuer exercises its redemption option, it's basically forcing the holders to convert. So again, think about it from the investor standpoint. You've got this convertible bond. It's trading at a premium to the value of the stock that they would get if they convert. If the issuer calls this and says, I'm going to give you a $1,000 par back, the value of that option drops to zero. And so it's the same make whole feature that we described in the fundamental change. It's simply an increase to the conversion ratio such to, to compensate the investors for the lost value of that option. And to Anna's point, um, you know, if, if in, investors prefer a five-year bullet, and so there is some interplay between the pricing of the convert and this redemption feature, but it's, it's not much. It's not, you know, it's not 100 basis points in coupon. It might be 25 basis points um, higher than if you had just done a five-year security. But the flexibility the issuer gets for that 25 basis points is pretty significant, especially if the stock is, is performing very well. The issuer wants to cut off the dilutive of impact of the security before, before the stock doubles or more. So it gives them a, a, an avenue to do that. Okay, just a few quick um, additional points before we, we wrap up. Um, so next slide, the securities exchange rules. Um, particularly in the case where an issuer is offering um, converts on a private placement, so on a straight um, 4A2 Reg D basis, it's very important to be sensitive to the fact that in certain instances, um, the fact that the notes may convert into more than 20% of the total shares outstanding um, looked at uh, based on the total shares outstanding on the date on which the convert is issued may trigger um, shareholder vote requirements for the stock exchanges. Usually, we deal with this by putting um, a stopper provision in or a blocker provision in, and that um, addresses this. Um, the NYSC has a bona fide private financing provision. Uh, the NYSC provision was recently tinkered with, recently amended um, just about a month and a half ago, and that update is on our blog. So now the bona fide private financing provision is <coughs> worded somewhat differently, still useful for 144A offerings. Um, but be attentive to, to the changes to that. Next slide. Um, we talked about these various anti-dilutive transactions, so the, the repurchases, whether an outright repurchase, the, the call overlays, and all of these different types of structures. And next slide, um, the straight open market repurchases. So all of these transactions, as Remmel talked about, raise tax issues. Um, they can raise accounting issues in terms of how um, they're reflected um, in the context of the convert issuance. 
it's also important to take into account that um, these transactions raise um, other concerns as well from a securities and a corporate governance perspective. So um, any, all of the various different types of transactions we've talked about um, should be considered just in light of whether they're being done um, with the protections of, or at least analogized to um, 10B18 conditions, if 10B18 isn't strictly available, the safe harbor for issuer repurchases. So 10B18, for example, is not available for accelerated share repurchases. It would be available for a straight repurchase. Um, likewise, if um, the issuer is going to avail itself of an issuer 10B51 plan um, for any of these and ensuring that the issuer is uh, not in possession of material non-public information at the time that it's engaging in any direct or indirect repurchase and all of these anti-dilutive transactions obviously are transactions in the issuer's own equity security. So that's um, a very important consideration. Um, and I'll end with just a note. We've written a fair bit recently about the fact that our new SEC chair seems quite intently focused on all of these 10B51 plans, 10B18 plans, issuer repurchases, um, the handling of material non-public information, controls uh, that companies have in place when they're engaging in all of these activities. So very worth a close look in terms of how companies are documenting their decisions to enter into these activities. And um, you'll see our blog and our new um, our new fun little glossary um, that we'll hope we hope you take a look at. And, and Ramel, thank you. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to email Pete and Claude directly or email any of us and we'll send around today's materials.